Homo sapiens, who are we? Where did we come from? In chapter five, we will continue our look at our ancient ancestors on the family tree Homo with the help of paleoanthropology. In chapter four, we begin our look at the genus Australopithecus. In chapter five, we will delve deeper into the role Australopithecus plays on our family tree. Let's refresh our memory with an overview of the family tree Homo. In the past chapters, we have looked at Sahel Anthropus, Auroran, and Ardipithecus. This brings us up to about four and a half million years in the past. Australopithecus will take us from around the four million year mark to the two million year mark. Starting around two and a half million years in the past, we will begin to encounter our ancestors in the genus Homo. Our own species, Homo sapiens, will make an appearance around 200,000 years in the past. But before we begin our look at Australopithecus, let's take a moment to digress. Back in chapter three, we touched on some of the components driving the evolution of species. Let's take a moment to look at the climatic factors affecting the evolution of our ancestors in Eastern Africa. Across the millions of years of our Earth's history, one of the most important factors driving evolution has been the ever-changing surface of the Earth. Via plate tectonics and continental drift, the Earth itself is evolving. The movement of land masses causes changes in ocean currents, wind patterns, global temperatures, and climatic conditions over thousands and millions of years. Everyone is familiar with the look and appearance of our Earth today from maps, globes, and photos of our planet from space. But if we went back to the Permian period some 255 million years ago, we would find a very alien-looking Earth. All of the continental masses that exist today were grouped together into a supercontinent which we now call Pangaea. Slowly, over the eons, plate tectonics and continental drift reshaped our world. By 200 million years in the past, Pangaea had broken up into two continental groups which geologists call Laurasia and Gondwanaland. By the 150 million year mark, we would see land masses that could be recognized as precursors to the continents we know today. By the 65 million year mark, at the time of the asteroid strike that is theorized to have caused the demise of the dinosaurs, the Earth we know today was beginning to take shape. From 65 million years ago to the present, the surface of the Earth we recognize today took its form. But the tectonic plates of the Earth are still in motion. Millions of years in the future, the surface of the Earth will again be very different. As we noted earlier, this movement of land masses affects global climate. If we could visit our Earth 65 million years in the past, we would find a world that was warm with little temperature variation from the equator to the poles. But around the 50 million year mark, we would start to note a change. The Earth began to cool. The global climate overall became cooler with periods of rapid cooling at the 33 million year mark, the 15 million year mark, and the 3 million year mark. Three main factors are cited in this cooling trend. Number one, the collision of the Indian subcontinent with the Asian landmass, which resulted in the upthrusting of the Earth's crust leading to the creation of the Himalaya Mountains and the Tibetan Plateau starting about 50 million years ago. Number two, changes in the topography of the North Atlantic Basin which reduced the northward flow of warm surface water. Number three, the closing of the Tethys Sea by a land bridge that formed between the African and Eurasian continents. This land bridge blocked the connection which had existed between the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, reducing the area of tropical and subtropical oceans present-day Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea are remnants of the ancient Tethys Sea. Of these three factors, the uplifting of the Tibetan Plateau may be the most important. In the late Miocene, around the 8 million year mark, there was considerable uplifting of the Tibetan Plateau by between 1 and 2.5 and kilometers. This uplifting had a wide-ranging impact on the weather systems affecting eastern Africa. A strong flow of warm, dry air from East Central Asia replaced the moist, low-level oceanic winds which had impacted the East African environment. The result was that Eastern Africa began to dry out. The climatic picture of Eastern Africa was further complicated by local faulting and uplifting of terrain in the Great Rift Valley. This led to a fractured and ever-changing environment which oscillated between periods of wet and dry over thousands of years. This dynamic environment eventually pushed our ancestors from a forested environment to one of wooded grasslands and open savannas. Our ancient ancestors evolved in a very dynamic environment. You could say that our DNA was forged in the fire of chaos. Out of this fire came a creature whose greatest attribute was that it was capable of dealing with change. More so than any creature that had existed prior, our ancestors were evolving the ability to overcome the changing environment through intelligence, social interdependence and the harnessing of technology. We were becoming the ultimate survivor. 
With this in mind, let's return to our look at the genus Australopithecus. Let's see what role they played in this dynamic saga that led to the evolution of our genus, Homo. As we begin a more in-depth look at the genus Australopithecus, let's review some of the major points covered in Chapter 4 and earlier in this video. The genus Australopithecus ranged across eastern Africa over a period of two to two and a half million years and possibly more. The geographical range appears to cover most of eastern Africa with some fossil evidence indicating the possibility of westward extension of the range into central Africa into present day Chad. The three main species of Australopithecus recognized by paleoanthropologists are Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus afarensis, and Australopithecus africanus. Two other species of Australopithecus named are Australopithecus bar el Ghazali and Australopithecus sediba. Another group of Australopithecines, known as the robust Australopithecines, is thought to constitute a separate genus which has been given the name Paranthropus. The robust Australopithecines are thought to represent a different evolutionary line which did not contribute to the genus Homo, and therefore, we will not cover them in this video. Fossils of Australopithecus enamensis have been dated to around 4.2 to 3.9 million years ago. The fossils representing about 20 individuals have been found in Kenya and Ethiopia. The first fossil of Australopithecus enamensis was found at Kanapoi near Lake Turkana in 1965 by Brian Patterson. The fossil was tentatively assigned to the genus Australopithecus at the time. It was not until 1995 that further research and discoveries in the Lake Turkana region led paleoanthropologist Meave Leakey to assign the 1965 fossil and other new discoveries to a new species christened Australopithecus anamensis. In 2006, new fossil remains of Australopithecus anamensis were found in the middle of Wash River Valley in Ethiopia by Dr. Tim White. These new anamensis fossils were discovered just six miles from the site of the discovery of fossils of Artipithecus ramidus, which were dated to 4.4 million years ago. The fossils of Australopithecus anamensis were dated to 4.2 million years ago, thus representing a separation in time of about 200,000 years for these two relatives on our family tree. Fossils of other animal remains found at the Lake Turkana site indicate that Australopithecus anamensis lived in a transitional environment consisting of a mixture of woodland and grassland with rivers present. Fossil leg bones of anamensis seem to indicate that it was bipedal, that it walked upright on two legs. In general, the fossil record of Australopithecus anamensis is rather sparse. Hopefully future field research will fill in the unknowns on anamensis and what role it plays on our family tree. Australopithecus anamensis shows characteristics which are transitional between Artipithecus ramidus and Australopithecus afarensis. Some paleoanthropologists believe that anamensis should be classified with the Australopithecine species afarensis and should not be considered a separate species. Let's now take a look at Australopithecus afarensis and see what role afarensis plays on our family tree. Fossils of Australopithecus afarensis have been discovered in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania. The fossil remains have been dated from 3.9 to 2.7 million years in the past. The species of Australopithecus designated afarensis was first named in 1978 by Donald Johansson and Tim White following the study of fossils found in northeastern Ethiopia. The fossils Johansson and White were studying were those of one of the most widely publicized examples of Australopithecus afarensis ever found, the famous Australopithecine christened Lucy. The fossil remains of Lucy were discovered in November of 1974 by Donald Johansson and Tom Gray. The fossils were found in the Afar Triangle Middle of Wash area near Hadar, Ethiopia. The fossils of Lucy were dated to 3.2 million years ago. This schematic of the soil layers gives a general idea of the stratigraphy of the site in which the fossils of Lucy were found. Potassium argon dating of the volcanic layers in the formation were important in establishing the date of the fossils. The research team found several hundred bone fragments which represented about 40% of the entire skeleton of Lucy, one of the most complete Australopithecine skeletal remains ever found. 
It was estimated that Lucy stood about three feet six inches tall or about 1.1 meters. She weighed in at around 65 pounds. Her appearance would have been somewhat chimpanzee-like, but her posture would have been more upright. Lucy's spine had a lumbar curve, which indicates habitual bipedalism. She also had a valgus knee, which is a further indicator of walking upright. If we look at the pelvic bones of a chimpanzee, an australopithecine, and a member of our own species, Homo sapiens, we can see that the australopithecine pelvic bones are much closer to that of Homo sapiens than that of chimpanzees. The movement of australopithecines was becoming more human-like and less chimpanzee-like. Environmental dynamics coupled with natural selection were driving our ancestors down a path of cascading change. Changes in locomotion would impact hand-eye coordination, which would impact brain size and intelligence, which would impact social structure and nurture bonding between males and females, which in turn impacted sexual selection. This complex and dynamic milieu was creating a biological feedback loop that was pushing our ancestors toward becoming human. In Chapter 6, we will continue our look at the genus Australopithecus and the role they play on the family tree Homo with the help of paleoanthropology.